are the dynamic wrinkles and those are the ones come frowning and smiling and laughing. And then there are static wrinkles that just come from over time from aging. When I see people who frown a lot, yes, you will be more predisposed. When people smile a lot, they might get the crow's feet more. I'm not going to take away the smiling, but I may help them with the frowning. Hello, and welcome to the Merck Manuals Medical Myths Podcast. I'm your host, Joe McIntyre, and thank you all for joining us. Today is part three of our discussion with Dr. Jeanette Kirai. Dr. Kirai is an associate professor of dermatology and cutaneous surgery at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She is also chief of dermatology service at Miami VA Hospital. Dr. Kirai, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. I'm so happy to be here this morning. Great. On this episode, we're going to dive into some skincare beauty myths, the first of which I can bust right up front. This is not just a discussion for those who wear makeup. We're going to talk to Dr. Kirai about a number of skincare topics that affect all of us, especially as we age. And speaking of aging, Dr. Kirai, do anti-aging creams actually work? Yes, they do. They do work, some better than others. We know that we have good data from our prescription anti-agers way back in the 1990s. If you look at the before and after pictures of women in their 70s, I use it as a impetus to help my patients decide to start using topical anti-agers because they look at those articles from the 1990s. I show them the before and afters, and these are in medical journals, so it is validated they get excited and they start using anti-agers. But the thing about anti-agers is you can't expect them to make a 70-year-old look like a 50-year-old. You can't make a 40-year-old look like a 20-year-old. You have to be realistic in your expectations, but they do work. Is there a time of your life or an age when you should start thinking about them? Or um, is there, conversely, a time where it's too soon to start using anti-aging creams? So the number one anti-ager is the sun, is sun protection or the sunscreen. So you can start doing that, you know, over the age of six months, basically, to protect the skin. So that is one of the best things you can do. How I explain it to my patients is you got to start with the sunscreen. You don't want to ask me for a wrinkle cream until you use the sunscreen. As far as the creams that help with, quote, wrinkles, some of the best are the retinoids, which are the derivatives of vitamin A, but the antioxidants are also good. You may know an antioxidant as a vitamin C or a coenzyme Q10. So they do work, but you got to start with the sunscreen. That's great. That's great advice. Now, are anti-aging creams only for women? I know you look at commercials on TV and that seems to be the case, but I'm sure you're going to bust that one right away. Joe, that's so unfair for you, okay? Um, (laughs) And I can see you now as we're doing this podcast, so I can tell you, you don't need them. You don't really need anything, but I will tell you that it's so untrue. Men need it too. Men are using more cosmetic procedures than ever before. They're going in for chemical peels and Botox and different types of cosmetic procedures. Why not have a man start at home with something simple? like a cream at bedtime. That's how I would take it. And of course, that sunscreen. Now, is it possible once wrinkles appear in your face um, to get rid of them with creams or ointments? Yeah, you can. Uh, You can with the topical retinoids and with some of the other topical anti-agers. And there's a whole huge industry based on different products that are not just retinoids, which are the vitamin A's. So yes, you can. Um, You can get rid of wrinkles or as the product insert will say often for over-the-counter treatments, it'll say reduce the appearance of wrinkles. So you can make yourself look better and some of them actually help a fair amount. Dr. Kirai, are chemical peels and these more severe skin um, or more serious, I guess, rather skincare treatments bad for you or are they okay? They're okay. We use chemical peelings not only for aesthetics, which means making us feel better about how we look, but we also use them in the treatment of precancers, um, something called an actinic keratosis. So I do not feel skin pills aren't safe, but they have to be done by people who know what they're doing. 
Now, how about sleeping in makeup? Does this cause breakouts, acne, or worse? Is this unsafe for you to sleep in your makeup if you put that on uh, during the day? You should wash your makeup off before you go to bed. Um, it can aggravate acne because if the skin is occluded for too long, the makeup's meant to be worn during the day and maybe into the night. It's not meant to be worn for through the next day with your face rubbing against a pillow. Um, we had talked about acne mechanica in the past, and that's where the skin is rubbed by something such as a COVID mask. Um, same thing can happen if you leave the makeup on with the pillow and everything's rubbing. So we want patients to wash their face before they go to bed. Whether you're a parent or a seasoned professional, a medical student or a caregiver, the Merck Manuals has the right medical information in the best format. And it's always free, easy to access, and readily available for you. Now, can you moisturize your skin too much? And how often should someone apply a moisturizer to their skin, especially their face? When you think about moisturizer, think about the skin is wanting to be at a happy place. And the happy place is when it's not too moist and when it's not too dry. So if you over moisturize, you may clog some pores. Um, there are people who don't need a lot of moisturizer. They have enough sebum or oil in their skin. So again, we want that happy place, not too dry, not too, not too moisturized, right in a perfect balance. Now, I assume on that same kind of vein there, uh, you can actually over exfoliate your skin too by causing it to be more dry than it should be. Yes, I've had many patients think that if they scrub harder, that they will get rid of their acne. So you don't want to over exfoliate. I am always a proponent of very minimal exfoliation or exfoliation just with the product um, and nothing aggressive. Is more expensive or costlier makeup and other skincare products better for your skin than cheaper alternatives? And additionally, is it more effective um, when it comes to skincare products and anti-aging creams? I'm going to say no to this, and I'm a big proponent of drugstore brands. Um, the drugstore brands can be very good. So can what we call prestige cosmetics, and that's where you go into your department store uh, and get some higher-end products. What I find is that you have to search, and you can find a product in the drugstore that is as good as a product that you might pay a lot more for at a high-end department store. So... These companies, they want their products to work. They want people to like them. They don't want them to clog pores or cause allergic reactions. So they put a lot of effort into them. So I don't think things have to be expensive. Now, when it comes to the body soaps we use, is there a way you recommend someone choose one? I personally use a sensitive skin body soap, um, but are there other products you would recommend? How should someone choose um, you know, the way they wash themselves every day? So how I tell people to shower is to take short showers. So the water can be the dryer, not as much the soap, but the soap can also contribute. I pick mild soaps. Sometimes the word is a syndet soap, which is a soap that is uh, has a, a less irritating component to it. But in general, the shorter time in the shower will protect those with sensitive skin. They should look for things generally that don't have strong fragrances or say unscented. And then as far as which one they use, it's going to be their personal preference, whether they like a liquid or a bar soap. A lot of my colleagues like the liquid soaps, but cost consciously, I recommend bar soaps often. Now, we do see this myth quite often uh, asked on the Merck manuals and online. Does our skin adapt to some skincare products, meaning we should switch the products and brands we use often? You know, Joe, I love this question because I thought about this long and hard, and there have been studies to disprove that our skin gets sensitive. For example, if a shampoo starts working, there's some good studies out there that say the shampoo doesn't stop working, probably keeps working. What it is, I believe, is that our bodies change. So, that the soap I used when I was 35 is not going to be the, the same soap I use at 55. But that is not as striking as maybe the soap you use at 12 versus the soap you use at 30. So as our bodies change or our environment changes, maybe I lived in Pennsylvania and now I live in Florida. 
So you're going to need to adjust your products somewhat based on where you live in your environment and what you're doing. So I think it's more we change than we get used to things. Got it. That's good to know. Now, if we make a lot of facial expressions, let's say we're frowning, smiling, laughing a lot, uh, are we more likely to get wrinkles on our face faster? So there are two types of wrinkles on the face. There are the dynamic wrinkles, and those are the ones come frowning and smiling and laughing. And then there are static wrinkles that just come from over time from aging. Will you get more? I think that when I see people who frown a lot, yes, you will be more predisposed. When people smile a lot, they might get the crow's feet more. I'm not going to take away the smiling, but I may help them with the frowning. That's good. That's good. Now, we mentioned this a little bit in our podcast discussion about acne, but satin pillows have become very popular recently for skincare, for protecting your hair. Do these satin pillows actually help your skin? Do they prevent wrinkles? So I thought about this question a lot, too. If you think about it, have you ever woken up and you have a crease on your face because you've slept a certain way? Oh, yeah. So before the crease and before the pillow, the thing you can do that's the best for sleeping is sleep on your back. It takes about three months to change your how your sleeping habit. If you sleep on your side regularly and you want to switch to your back, it'll take about three months, if that's good for you medically for everything else. So in my mind, the satin and silk pillows probably help some because if you do sleep on the side, you're going to push that skin a little bit more harshly into a more firm pillowcase. But the best thing you can do is not a pillowcase. It is to sleep on your back for the anti-aging, for the acne, and not have the skin against any type of material at night. So Dr. Kirai, before I let you go, where should our listeners head to for information about skincare beauty, how to properly care for their skin? Um, Are there any places you recommend they, they check out first? Sure. I would send them to their dermatologist. The Merck Manual has some information, but also the American Academy of Dermatology has a lot of information on such questions. Well, Dr. Kirai, we covered not just a ton of information on this episode, but on our previous two episodes about acne and protecting ourselves from the sun's harmful rays. For any listeners who haven't checked those out yet, I strongly recommend you do. They're loaded with great information, a lot of myth-busting as well. And to our listeners, I want to thank you for joining us. And for Dr. Kirai, I'll let her leave you with the message we always leave our listeners. Thanks, everybody. Remember, medical knowledge is power. Pass it on. Pass it on.